Alrighty, so I know that some individuals may be joining us at a later time. However, uh, I would like to go ahead and ask Dr. Alexander Zichlag, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at Worldwide, to go ahead and uh, give some opening remarks for us. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us this evening. Thank you, Brianna, and welcome everybody. So this is an uncommon time for our series, um, but we consciously picked it to, to limit um, time zone disruption because this is actually a new and a first in our still relatively new series on resilience reimagined because this is a tri campus um, presentation on um, an uh, trailblazing, I will say, um, undergraduate student research project that we uh, currently have, uh, where Worldwide is leading and coordinating, coordinating an effort across all our three uh, embryonal campuses that is Worldwide, Daytona Beach and Prescott on, um, like I said, an undergraduate student research project on optimizing human performance in airport security. And um, this falls under resilience reimagined because obviously, you know, um, limiting or addressing vulnerability gaps is um, part of, of resilience. And then also um, the end state of Homeland Security, the Homeland Security vision that is a, a resilience uh, based um, uh, whole, whole community. And um, because unfortunately, 9-11 uh, uh, and the, the creation of Homeland Security as a policy area and then also as, a, as an organization uh, in the form of a federal department, as, as we know, that had that was triggered um, by by um, airport security gaps in the first place, as we know. So therefore, we also have a responsibility as a university that offers homeland security programs to to address that um, um, aspect that unfortunately became part of the founding story of, of homeland security. Um, Originally, or basically, this series brandishes um, expertise and programs of, of um, Embryonal Worldwide and its College of Arts and Sciences, um, where we have a human security and resilience um, online master's program. So if you would like to learn about more, uh, to learn more about that, you'll find the link um, to our Department of Security Emergency Services in the chat. But this year is really about Embryonal as one university with its three campus and three collegiate effort, where all three colleges of arts and sciences that Embryonal have um, work together um, on um, um, opening up this exciting um, student research um, opportunity. Um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome all of our speakers and in particular, um, all of our participants today. And um, some of you have joined before, some haven't. So welcome to the series. And I would then last but not least like you to meet the principal investigator um, for that uh, project who is um, Gian Aydina who is an um, assistant professor in our um, Worldwide College of Arts and Sciences School um, or Department of Security and Emergency Services. And he is also the program chair for our Bachelor of Science program, online program in Homeland Security. And Jihan will talk a little bit about the Optimus project um, on optimizing human performance and airport security. We'll introduce the speakers and then we'll, we'll run the show and I'll be back um, to moderate Q&A um, towards the end of our program um, today. Jihan, please take it away. And once again, thanks for coming and thanks for presenting. Uh, thank you, Dean Alexander. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, I want to summarize our project. Uh, and in this project, our main problem was, uh, as you know, in today's persistent threat environment, strengthening the airport security screening checkpoint with its uh, holistic human, social, and technological ecology in mind is an ongoing challenge. And in our project, our goal uh, to address human performance optimization in commercial uh, air transportation by integrating human factors principles into Homeland Security deterrence and detection tasks, procedures, training, and technology interfaces at security checkpoints. So uh, to accomplish this goal, we came together with five students from our three colleges. And I want to introduce these uh, fabulous students, uh, Margaret Caldwell from Prescott University, Prescott College, and 
uh, we have uh, Amor Hunter, Madison Werner. Uh, they are not with us today, unfortunately, uh, because of some uh, emergent last moment uh, events. And we also have uh, Tianun Frakor and Hulk. Uh, and uh, now we will uh, begin with Maggie. Uh, Margaret from Prescott campus, and then continue with Hulk. Thank you so much for joining us. Please make it. Hello, everyone. My name is Margaret Caldwell, and in this project, I was looking at the effects of fatigue and shift work on visual search and object tracking tasks in TSA officers and air traffic controllers. So as we start looking at this, I'm going to explain what I'm actually researching and why there's a need to look at this. There are quite a few studies done looking at vis visual search tasks, shift work, and how that impacts people, and object tracking tasks. There are studies done combining both visual search tasks and shift work within TSA. There are shift work and object tracking tasks within ATC. And then the combination of any other studies looking at the visual search tasks and object tracking tasks. So what I'm really trying to do is pulling together all of those things to really examine how that shift work, the visual search tasks, and the object tracking tasks play an impact on TSA and ATC within this. So let's start by breaking this down a little bit more. So what actually is fatigue? There are three separate types of fatigue. There's physical fatigue, which is caused by sleep deprivation, exertion, illness, and poor nutrition. There's mental fatigue, which is caused by intense concentration or rapid and complex information processing and demanding mental situations. Additionally, there is emotional fatigue. This is the wearing effects of working under different trying conditions. Some of the effects that this has on you is overall, it decreases your cognitive function. It impairs the ability to perform tasks requiring concentration, dexterity, and any higher level intellectual processes. You have decreased vigilance and you have issues recalling information. So how this works in the brain is first you're going to encode the information. It's going to your storage, either long-term, short-term, or working. And based upon that, you're going to retrieve it using different methods. Now, what impact does this actually play? Well, when you're fatigued, it can impact somewhere in between there, either between encoding and storage or storage and retrieval. So what is shift work? Shift work is the division of working hours being broken up to sections. And within ATC, this is typically a rotating schedule. There's many different types of shift work, including full-time, which is typically standard hours of, I work nine to five each and every day. Part-time, which is standard fluctuating hours, rotating around the number of hours that someone can work. There's a flexible type of shift work, which is the time employees come to work and leave work can change depending. A rotating shift schedule. This is the first shift, first, second, and third shift workers. And this can change and rotate throughout the time that they're working there. There's a split shift, which is where individuals will come for the first half of a shift, leave in the middle, and come back for the second half. On call, which is you come in whenever you are needed, and compressed schedules, which is when you work a shorter number of days with more hours per day. Each of these has different benefits and different, different pros and cons to each of these. So, the body has natural rhythms called the circadian rhythm. This is the body's natural sleep-wake cycle, and it's associated with different proteins, light cycles, and typical periods of alertness. As we can see during the day and night, there's an oscillation of hormones and genes. During the day, you have those high highs where you have the most alertness, and then at night, you're going to fall into when you're sleeping. As you age, this is going to get less and less. So, you need less hours of sleep because you're not as tired and those genes are not oscillating nearly as much. So what are some of the disorders that go along with this? Well, there is delayed sleep, which is when your sleep pattern is delayed anything more than two hours. There's shift work disorder, which is insomnia, excessive sleepiness, and this affects those who normally sleep during waking hours or vice versa. 
there's irregular sleep-wake cycles. This is a lot of naps throughout the day and no long sleeping period. And the non-24 hours sleep-wake syndrome. This is when the internal clock runs anything longer than 24 hours. These can have a huge effect on the people who are trying to operate as well as they can within these times. So what actually is a visual search task? Well, this is a perceptual task using attention to scan an environment for a feature or an item among other potential distractors. So looking at this graph that we have on screen, this would be asking somebody to find the F. This requires you to search and scan in order to find that one item. In comparison, an object tracking task is a perceptual task using attention to scan and follow one item among other potential distractors. So as we look at the graph to our right, what we see is that you're maintaining your fixation on target, you're picking out what you need to find, you're going to track it, and then you're going to select the ones that you want. So if you remember as a kid, when somebody would take a bunch of cups and put an item under the cup, what they would do is they would shift it all around. And you would say, that's the one that I started with at the beginning. That is the same thing as an object tracking task, or that it's an object tracking task. So there are quite a few different studies done. And one of these is looking at firefighters. This study was looking at their ability to see how the night shift and being woken up have on the subjective view of the firefighters of their fatigue levels. One of the main takeaway from this article is that there are many different things that are affecting the psychological and physiological abilities of the firefighters. And those who were rotating on the night shift did not have nearly as good quality sleep. We also learned that the disturbances are poten potentially caused while sleeping reduce the sleep quality and further impair the abilities of them to perform. They were subjectively more tired and they had critical flicker fusion frequency. So this is the rate in which we're seeing something, where in movies, that's how fast you're able to process it, and that's at a certain rate. This rate slows down when you're more fatigued, so they were seeing things in more, in more slideshow-like things, where they were not getting the information processed as quickly as they should have been. Their oral temperature showed that those who did not get more sleep had a lower body temperature and relatedly performed worse. One of the other places that has a lot of different studies done on it is in the driving field. This is because millions of people are doing this every year, every day. So we're able to study this a lot more easily than places such as an ATC and TSA because there's more people doing it. We can see that the workload is reflected by mental tasks. So the more mental tasks that are being performed, there's going to be a higher mental workload on the person. There's also reduced situational awareness when there is a higher mental workload. However, one important thing is that relevant stimuli are favored over irrelevant stimuli, such as when there's a car in front of you, you're going to pay attention to that more than the radio that is next to you. However, targets are looked at less frequently when performing a mental task. So some of those are looking at the rear view mirror and the side view mirrors. What they did is they said, multiply these numbers. And when they were performing that mental workload, they were not checking those other stimuli, such as the mirrors and the rear view mirrors. We were able to view this based upon the pupil dilation and other physiological indicators. So the speed accuracy trade-off, what is it? Speed accuracy trade-off is basically when somebody is going to sacrifice a speed for getting things more accurate or vice versa, and they're going to sacrifice their accuracy for their speed. This study specifically was looking at professional versus non-professional professionals within TSA. What we determined is that the speed went to the non-professionals. They were able to perform these tasks faster. The accuracy also went to the non-professionals. The reason for this, however, is because as their speed increased, they were able to get through more trials. So what this showed us is that they had a lower consistency than the professionals.
The professionals took longer and they were less overall accurate because they were doing less trials, but they were far more consistent. What we learned is that the age goes both ways because as you age, you are going to naturally slow down. However, your accuracy is going to increase just because you're taking longer to look at the stimuli. So let's look at how visual search studies have affected this. This study was looking at the efficiency of working with assistive technology. It noted that working in teams helped the second person to find the target faster and overall increases of the time for the first, set, first searcher to detect the target. Shared gaze technology was, they, it allowed them to be faster at reaching consensus when searching on their own. However, it does increase the time that it takes for the first searcher to overall detect the target. So the slower, they are slower with the shared gaze technology. <clears throat> than when they are just working in parallel without the shared gaze technology. So when they're communicating next to each other, hey, this is where I see it, and the other person is looking for it, they are faster than when they're using a shared gaze technology. So behavior detection officers and transportation security officers, both of these are part of the TSA. What this study is, is it is looking at the differences. What a BDO officer is, is it is a person who is looking at the behaviors of certain individuals. They're responsible for looking for any suspicious behaviors of travelers, whereas the transportation security officers are looking in the bags for anything suspicious. They work in coordination with each other. However, the BDO officers were once former TSO officers. So what we learned from this is that we're going to look at predictors such as personality traits, abilities, hobbies, and spatial abilities. This illustrated that the spatial abilities was a predictor for the TSO officers, but the frequency of video gameplay was a predictor for the behavior detection officers. The, there were shorter search times when associated with individuals who frequently played video games, specifically third-person shooter, first-person person shooter, logic, and puzzle. The more conscientious TSO officers were more consistent in their overall searches. And their high and higher level of impulsiveness are less consistent search times for the TSO officers. The BDO are more tenured and they were more diligent in their searches when they were asked to perform the same tasks. Overall, between the TSO and the BDO officers, those who played video games searched the images faster than those who played less frequently. So what are some of the air traffic control studies that have been done? One of them is the Indonesian air traffic control studies. This was looking at the chronotypes and the individual preferences about sleepiness being determined by the clock genes. A chronotype is basically, are you a morning owl or are you a night owl? When do you feel the most awake? We found that when the person was working a shift that correlated with their chronotype, they had a lower mental workload, better alertness, and they were less tired overall. The rapid counterclockwise shift rotation showed that shift rotations result in sleep loss. The sleep decreased when there were earlier rise times for the air traffic controllers. On average, air traffic controllers are getting 2.2 hours of sleep within this study. And that shows us that there is not nearly enough sleep because we don't let our pilots fly fatigued or we aim to not have them fly fatigued. However, our air traffic controllers who are in charge of them are not getting the sleep that they need. What we learned from this study is that we should not be implementing the 4D counterclockwise rapidly rotating schedules as employees are not getting enough sleep. However, the reason that we do it is because the is for employee satisfaction. They do not like continually working either the morning or the night shift due to the differences in the air traffic 
as during the night they're significantly less than in the day. So safety culture and resilient behavior and stress in ATC. As we look at this graph on the right, this is looking at how physiological stress has a positive effect on the resilient behavior and a negative effect on the safety culture. If we start here in the upper right, we can see all of the stressors, such as general stress, emotional stress, social stress, conflicts and pressure, fatigue, lack of energy, somatic complaints. And then we start out in the recovery, which is the success, social relaxation, somatic relaxation, general well being, and sleep quality. All of these are inputting into different categories, so that, such as the social, emotional stress and performance related stresses. When all of those are working in coordination with each other, that is going to lead to a safety culture that is not being presented as it needs to when all these stressors are on the employees. Whereas when they're able to use those recovery methods, it is leading to a better development of the safety culture and a, the organization's resilience increases. So as we continue our research, all of these different studies are done. However, as I illustrated at the beginning with the chart, these are not coming together to really show what we need to do in order to increase the security within our groups and within our TSA. So why this? We want to do this because this is something that is important to us because our security and safety matters. Where are we planning on going with this? We're planning on using Biopack, which is a technology to look at physiological markers. We want to look at the heart rate and brain waves and different and how these are playing an impact into the circadian rhythms and the correlation between things such as the brain waves and circadian rhythms when performing a task in different phases of their fatigue and their sleep cycles. So what we're looking to do is monitor people at various different times to mimic the shift work and see the physiological effects and the behavioral performances on those tasks that they are performing. We're looking to do this at our university and potentially looking at the differences between those who have some training versus no training, such as our seniors versus our incoming freshmen in programs such as our ATC program. And this is how we're going to do it with the biopack. Thanks so much, Miggy. And now we can go next with Hal. Okay, so uh, my name is Hawk. I'll be presenting the developing critical thinking and effective communication skills um, part of this webinar. So starting off in TSA, human error still remains the number one cause of aviation accidents. Um, in a TSA context, think of this as a security checkpoint member um, operating a security scanner and security scanner works as normal, but they fail to detect um, something that the scanner was not, or potentially if they're working with a dog team and there's some matter of deception that provides a situation which they're uh, led to believe that the dog is giving them a false positive. Uh, why critical thinking? Critical thinking and effective communication, CTEC, in aviation, inspires problem solving and helps assist with informed decision making while using effective ways to communicate. CTEC and Optimus provide the ability to analyze complex situations, provide and inspire higher education on CTEC skills for aviation industry careers. Uh, why effective communication? Um, it's clear, concise, and unambiguous. Um, a main tool we use in this process is the SWOT analysis. Uh, the below table provides an analysis of strengths and weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. The result of the SWOT analysis was, deter uh, was determined through discusses of OSPCA personnel. So one strength we have is talented workforce, um, one weakness is resistance, and resistance to change, and um, another strength we have is clear priorities, another one is lack of consistency in messaging on our weakness end. We also have to keep in mind the other C's, um, which is something we've identified in this, in this closed loop communication. Uh, the elements of effective communication can be characterized to seven different principles, clear, correct, complete, 
concrete, concise, coherent, and courteous. Uh, now, critical thinking effect, uh, critical thinking and effective communication pedagogy. So we did a literature review um, and analysis of the scholarship um, based on a variety of sources, and we were able to identify some key themes, questions, and categorizations um, that were useful to our work. So first off, one of the tools we um, we identified was red teaming. Um, one element of red teaming is playing devil's is devil's advocacy. Um, the challenge, the challenging dominant view, the proposing best alternatives, a what if situation, realizing the risks um, better by thinking about what happens if the expect expected situation does not happen. Um, we also have brainstorming, providing uh, diverse perspectives about the situation, stakeholder mapping, highlighting perspectives of stakeholders. So there's a variety of red teaming techniques as we went over, um, which we kind of cat which were kind of categorized into a variety of um, analytical, analytical uses. Um, so we have challenge analysis, uh, such as role playing and outside outside inside thinking um structure analysis prioritizing and starbursting focusing the context and problem um such as customer checklist and issue rate re-identification and at the core of this we have enabling techniques such as critical thinking nominal group techniques and delphi method so as i mentioned before um, we identified some essential questions when looking at the literature and the scholarship on the subject um such as uh what are the reasons what are deceptive assumptions uh, are there any fallacies in reasoning and from there we uh discovered we created some groupings um for these questions to be able to more effectively use them in a critical thinking scenario in a more systematic approach now the benefits of teaching ctec uh, it's valuable and useful for the preparation of future aviation leadership. It's clear and concise uh, way of thinking, and it promotes situational awareness. What we will have uh, done for the TSA work first when completing our study. So after the study, we are going to have a comprehensive guide to uh, effective communication styles aviation, for aviation professionals, TSA agents in our case. Um, and inspire the conversations in critical thinking. Um, and will also help tackle effective, ineffective behaviors and shorten mental fatigue. And that's it. Wonderful, great, outstanding. So this has been some, some good um, also interim project um, results reporting. And um, with that, um, I would like to open um, the floor maybe first to to Jihan for for some feedback as the PI and then for uh, questions that you may either uh, you know pose vocally if you want you know by by uh, taking the mic or just leave on the chat and uh, with that the 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 floor is open and maybe you can get us started Jihan and congratulations Maggie and 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 hawk um, um and and also kudos for doing this and this is also I, I want to say that because um this this really demonstrates how the three colleges of arts and sciences of Embry riddle are really invested in student uh success um which includes importantly includes um opening up early research opportunities for for students that are not just um you know, theoretical studies, but that are real world informed and and are also able to to give back to society by 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 recommending uh, changes that can make our um, air transportation system more safer and more secure. So that is also a direct contribution to um, customers, if I can say so, um, within the core business and founding and continuing primary mission of Embry-Riddle as an aeronautic university. So that's great. It also demonstrates how um, non-natural um, sciences 
um, branches of colleges of arts and sciences at a university like ours can contribute to, to such a, to that core business and mission. So kudos and thank you for demonstrating that and congratulations on, on your discoveries. With that, now finally um, over to Jihan to get the conversation and the dialogue started here. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Alexander. Uh, thank you, Nigi. Thank you for, for grand pre great presentations. Uh, maybe you can share with our uh, audience first, what was your first reaction when you heard about this project? And when we came together from you know, diverse topics while uh, you are working on uh, you know, a specific uh, social aspect of the uh, topic, uh, Hawk and he was working on critical thinking part of it. So what was your reaction and how uh, we are trying to combine these different elements together? Maybe you can share your feelings and thoughts about that first. Uh, sure. Um, so when I first got into this project, I was quite surprised of how holistically um, this topic was being um, approached through. Um, I come from a pretty um, unique um, education background and been flipping back and forth between um, a, a degree in human performance and strength and conditioning science at one college and my degree in Homeland Security at this one. And so I was very interested in the, um, uh, just the elements of how we were incorporating um, the very statistical data from how the human body is actually functioning and keeping that into account um, when we're also tying that into um, the critical thinking portion of the actual um, project. Thank you, Hope. Nikki, please. Absolutely. So when I got introduced to this topic from two of my professors, they reached out to me and they said, I think that you'd be a great fit for this. And I was like, I absolutely agree. So I'm studying human factor psychology and minoring in aviation safety. And this project and what I'm studying is really just tying those two passions together for me. It was really neat when we got to present this at the U.S. Capitol, getting to see really what the other individuals in this project were doing and seeing how it really ties together. It's absolutely something that is going to help drive research forward and really to develop the TSA and ATC and our safety as a whole and create programs so that everyone is trained and we can be more secure and safe. Thank you. Thanks so much, Megan. Uh, before going back to our audience, uh, I want to ask one more thing. Uh, what, you know, we came together for a short time and uh, it's very hard to create a, a perfect, you know, outcomes uh, in such a time, but you did a great job uh, with your uh, uh, other uh, peers so far. So uh, I want to thank about that first. And uh, I want to uh, learn about your vision for the outcomes for the projects. And also, uh, also I uh, wonder about the uh, Hawk's vision about the project in the future. Oh, that's a very good question. Um, my vision for the project is that hopefully um, we can expand upon this research, um, not just uh, through the scope of critical thinking, but um, through so many other attributes that are important um, to the actual operations of TSA, and maybe even also get this to a point where we can maybe expand this uh, work into working with um, adjacent um, security agencies and um, being able to give uh, some comprehensive um, help, whether it be in the form of manuals, um, ways to approach training or whatnot that could potentially contribute to um, the safety of Americans around the world. Perfect. Absolutely. I would have to agree with Hawk on that. Um, for this project, I'm really excited to actually get to the point where we can be distributing some of this stuff as here's the research that we have done and get to that point where instead of just doing like literature reviews on this and figuring out, but being able to go out there and get those boots on the ground studies done. 
So I think that that would be a really beneficial and interesting thing to further our research with. And with the manual side of it, creating those to say, here's what critical thinking does and here's why and have all the evidence to back it up and get it so that it is a more cohesive a more cohesive thing that we're doing with across across the United States to increase our security and make sure that everyone is the safest that they possibly can be. Perfect. Thanks so much. Now we have some questions from our audience. Uh, Anne Marie, hi, please. Hi, I'm Emory Yade, and I teach English, first of all, with Worldwide. So as the English teacher and me, I want to say congratulations, well done on your presentation. If I was your speech teacher, you would you would be scoring quite high. Um, so well done. And um, but also I wanted to just ask you, um, I lived in the D.C. area, Maryland, for quite a long time, and I have to admit I'm missing it. Um, how was your experience in D.C.? I mean, did you come back with some takeaways? Uh, what was that whole experience like? Absolutely. So I know that Hawk was not able to join us on that trip. So this one is on me to answer. Um, it was an absolutely incredible experience getting to come together with my peers and be able to present on this while being in such an important place to the nation. It was very, very powerful. Just getting to coordinate and talk to all these people. The networking opportunities were absolutely fantastic. Getting to be in the place where this legislation and stuff is passed and made was really interesting and in seeing this is the place and this is where these decisions are being made. Like the, it really became real. Like what we are doing is going to make an impact. We're just going to take the first steps to do it. So that was my overall experience. And the city, of course, it's absolutely beautiful. I had a wonderful trip out there. Awesome, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions for Hulk or Maggie? Uh, Hulk, uh, while talking about, you know, these manual and uh, other stuff, uh, we were uh, talking about, you know, uh, other uh, discussion points uh, for, you know, critical thinking, effective communication, and uh, really combining them uh, with other aspects of the Maggie's part and uh, Amor's part. Uh, so would you like to share uh, your vision and your uh, thoughts about that because uh, it was very great uh, while we are uh, talking about this and I also want our audience uh, listen about that if it's possible. Yeah, sure. Um, one of the main, oh, I'm not sure what just happened with my camera there. Um, one of the main uh, points I um, had brought up when going through the literature review um, and going through all the data research, we constantly um, hammered home the importance of people who in the TSA workforce who have uh, prior experience coming to TSA, whether it be in other law enforcement agencies um, or in the military, whether they've deployed, not deployed, whatever the case may be, and the importance that these pre-existing skill sets have to the TSA workforce. And one of the things that I want to uh, kind of have a uh, a bit of more of a deep dive into is for people who have these skill sets are already in some sort of higher up position, typically, you know, not necessarily the person at the checkpoint um, starting off, but how can they, um, while they're doing their managerial position or whatever position they may be uh, directly hired to do, um, how can they act as a force multiplier um, and, provi and provide um, mentorship toward more junior TSA agents um, who do not have this background. Um, and so they can have these lessons learned um, so that they don't have to learn them the hard way because, um, well, try to think of a way to phrase this, um, because sometimes, you know, the mistakes you make, especially with anything in a law enforcement or security capability, could also mean that, that you're putting a situation to where someone could be hurt or potentially um, be close to getting hurt. And so that we can just learn these important lessons um, um, without having to have um, those instances. Um, does that kind of make sense? 
Perfect. Thank you, Hope. I'm looking at our chat and our audience. Uh, if you have any questions for Maggie or Hope, uh, you can write on chat or just, you know, unmute it yourself and ask directly to them. Okay, uh, Mickey Hulk, uh, do you have uh, any questions or any uh, last thoughts? Perfect. My, I was going to say my only last thought is thank you all for coming and listening to us talk about this. It is absolutely very, very neat research. Um, and if you guys have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so yeah, much. Likewise. You guys, yeah, you guys did absolutely amazing. Seriously. So thank you for taking the time to, you know, be a part of this webinar for this evening. Um, seriously, such wonderful, um, wonderful presentations filled with a lot of knowledge. So thank you again, both for volunteering your time. <laughs> yeah, let me let me chime in and say thank you, everybody. And before you leave, let me point out the next occurrence in our series, Resilience Reimagined. That will be on August 22nd. I hope to see you again. And we'll be talking about building resilient and sustainable communities using a national preparedness system, social equity, whole community centered approach, and baseline resilience indicators for communities. So, a little bit of how do we measure resilience? Um, and it will be the speaker will be Michael Brown, who is a long term friend of me, of mine on, on LinkedIn, but more importantly, the president of the nonprofit. Uh, policy institute one world one way and he is really coming up with new ideas to think about resilience um out of the box like like we are you know i wanted to to close this out so i would hope to see you registration has just opened i posted the link but um there's a lot up there we, we were at, at 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 the u.s um capital obviously and in the house part of it and the house committee on homeland security is which is very really important They're obviously always uh, pushing for you know more funding to do more research to develop more technology and to integrate technologies and things like that but our and what you do this the uh Margaret Hawk and, and and colleagues and Jihan and everybody that demonstrates that even with without spending a ton of taxpayer money we can do so much to contribute to resilient nation using the example here with um actually focusing and optimizing um, human factors, uh, human factor uh, optimizing TSA security screening checkpoints from the human factors point of view uh, without, you know, integrating and, and, and whatever technology, which is important, but by just make it more efficient and effective through uh, using the human factor uh, point, if you will, as a sweet spot. And this is very important. Therefore, this project continues to deserve a lot of attention in Washington, D.C., and there will be more to follow. There will also be a final project report, and then the follow-on biopack study will, will add to the value. So this is very important. This is really a notable contribution um, that you are making. So thank you for that. And I am very proud, and you can be very proud um, of, of being um, a part of that. That once again comes out of a trilateral effort of three colleges of arts and sciences of Embry-Riddle as an aeronautical, aeronautical university. Uh, working together and then also demonstrating the rigor in our programs that that we have because this is an immersive research real world relevant and real world impactful um, um, uh, research project at the undergraduate level guided by subject matter expert faculty so once again thank you congratulations and also thank you for everybody thanks thanks everybody for taking um if it's if it's an evening or wherever it's, it's an evening somewhere but for taking the time to join us and also to present here and speak um at 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 uh, what is here a very nice summer day in july so that's appreciated um all the best for the rest of the the project um we'll be in touch and then i hope to see a lot of you again um uh, on the occasion of our next occurrence of resilience reimagined on august 22nd registration is open the link is in the chat once again thank you thanks brianna for organizing that and doing a lot of things behind the scenes we couldn't have organized that without you thank you also for doing some overtime time here in the office um 
because uh, you know so Brianna is also giving of her time so uh, we are very appreciative of that so have a great rest of your day wherever you are and hope to see you again soon stay safe be good thanks again bye bye bye